Hello, this is Gideon Emery, a.k.a. Balthier from Final Fantasy XII, telling you you're listening to the Raw Dogs podcast. And from this leading man, may you be the leading man in your own lives. Tune in, enjoy, farewell. Everybody, and welcome to another exciting episode of Hair of the Mogcast. This is Raw Mogs. Um, <laughs> I wanted to do that since I thought of it um, back when we had a Final Fantasy month. But this is Raw Dogs, your favorite podcast about blitzball and laughing and cringing and uh, likable, questionable racist characters with weird hair. <laughs> Lot, lots to take in. Fair. Um, we are part of the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Check out all of those other amazing shows. And my name is Brad. Uh, who else is here with us today? Uh, my name is Titus, because that's what I <laughs> typed in at the beginning of the game. <laughs> uh, Titus, actually. I'm going to say Titus, because I've been saying Titus for 15 years. So I, was like, so I like to Titus. hear. I'm going to say Titus, because that's right. Thank well, you. <laughs> and then, well, they're going to do like a remake and they're going to actually say it. it's going to be, oh, no, it's Kate Sith actually the whole time. It is Kate Sith. <laughs> oh, my God. They are going to have to name it all of a sudden. Oh, my God. Yeah, though, no, they actually changed it from the catchy to Kate Sith for the rebirth. That's like officially Kate Sith now instead. So all of my trivia for the past 10 years is gone. There's a moment of vindi- a moment of vindication for me. Like as speedrunning FF7, I, I would always just say Kate Sith because that's what I said when I was a kid. And every time, every every run without fail, there's always at least one new person to the chat who's like the hang on, let me push my glasses up. Well, actually, <laughs> <laughs> whose beautiful voice is that? All right, so I, I'm Mutsky. I'm a Final Fantasy streamer and speedrunner. It's my favorite series, and a lot of my favorite games are in this series. So yeah, I, I game and, and play RPGs. And, yeah, yeah, Mutsky, tell us a little bit about your your Final Fantasy, uh, your experience, like your streaming. Uh, so I'm actually we are quickly approaching my my 10 year anniversaries of uh, of Woo. of streaming Final Fantasy games. Yeah, I started my first ever Final Fantasy stream, speedrunning Final Fantasy Nine in January of 2014, um, and. I just kind of picked it up as a hobby um, when I moved really far from where I grew up. I'm from Pittsburgh ish. And then I moved to Houston for work and I had like no friends or family here. Kind of found my way to uh, the speedrunning community when I was just like looking for things to fill the void of my free time. And uh, then I met a bunch of cool people online doing that. So I just kind of kept doing it. And and since I've I've speedrun, I don't know, probably like seven or eight different Final Fantasy games um, among a bunch of other series um and and so yeah i've just been doing that for a long time i've made a lot of cool friends doing that so i I keep doing it it's it's definitely like a hobby um not something that i would ever want to do like full time but um it is something that i've invested like you know thousands and thousands of hours into over the last 10 years it's kind of an unfair advantage having uh speedrunners as guests because i've beaten the game you know five times and y'all have probably like Oh, yeah, just like 20, 30 times, maybe. Just last weekend. You know, it's pretty whatever. It's kind of a slow weekend. <laughs> well, it's funny. Whenever I got your email asking me if I'd be interested in doing it, I, w- I, w- I just wrapped up last night. I-, I had just finished playing Final Fantasy X, like, casually for the first time in, like, I don't know, 20 years almost, probably. The last time I probably played it was when I was in college. Um, and so I was literally finishing up a Final Fantasy X casual and... So at least the story and everything that I usually don't pay attention to at at all is kind of fresh. Um, And there were a lot of things that I never did in the game that a lot of people introduced me to that I just never really got into when I was younger. So that I obviously don't do. You don't really explore for the side content when you're speed running the game typically. So there were a lot of things that I just never done before. You just don't worry about those lightning bolts when you speed run. You just you run through there. Yeah, exactly. God. You don't care if the Besaid Oryx lose the game. The the newest route, I it's, it's very bad if you don't win. Oh wow! 
So, yeah. Oh, is that strength sphere like yeah. super important? Yeah, it's like a deal breaker now. It used to not oh, really okay. matter. It used to just be like a little bump, but now it's kind of a big deal, yeah. It's a big old bump now. It's a bump the reset button. Oh, no. And returning uh, to Raw Dogs once again, after the triumphant and glorious Final Fantasy IX episodes, uh, we are joined once mm-hmm. again by Spike Vegeta. Spike, how we doing? I'm doing great. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, the way you all will know me is as the person who is excited that Mutsky gets to join us. I recommended <laughs> Mutsky be on this episode because Mutsky is one of my favorite people on Twitch, unironically. I remember running into Mutsky, uh, ESA 2016. Uh, I'm pretty sure you were outside with a bunch of friends drinking. And I was like, holy shit, is that Mutsky? <laughs> and you were like, what? Is that? All right, Spike Vegeta, sure. Like, I've been around speedrunning for a while. I was like a classic Mutsky lurker for like Link to the Past streams and all the PlayStation Final Fantasies. Like, he, he, he kind of glossed over all the Final fa- You know, oh, I speedrun Final Fantasy. It was FF7, FF8, FF9, FF10. I, I forget if you've actually dabbled in 13 or not. Tons of Final Fantasy games and all of those seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours long. Um, by the way, here's a fun little fact I always like to bring up. It's, it's a little different now with the HD remakes and all the different ways to play it. But there was a time where Final Fantasy VII speedrun was seven hours. Final Fantasy VIII speedrun was eight hours. Final Fantasy IX speedrun was nine hours. And Final Fantasy X speedrun was ten hours. So there's your fun fact of the day. Nothing else we're going to talk about on this podcast is going to be a fun fact. <laughs> it's all but about the symmetry, really yeah. Yeah, I was like, how they're just gonna keep slapping another hour on there. And then FF13 was like, what if we sped it up? It'd be great. Yeah, I was I'm glad you brought it up. I was gonna bring it up at some point. I didn't know what the like springboard into it was, but like Spike and I have obviously met up and hung out at enumerated events at this point. But we yeah, we we met in Europe at a at a speedrunning right. event in Sweden, which is just like kind of like the exception, not the rule, obviously being <laughs> yes. both like in the in the States. So yeah, that's a thing. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. But yeah, we're obviously, we're both, uh, final fantasies are cool. I just played through final fantasy eight and final fantasy six just this year. I was like, you know what? I consider myself a final fantasy fan. I've played like four of these damn things. So I've been, I've been, I've been consuming them casually. I played FF 10, which is the game we're about to be talking about for the next few hours, just last year. And Man, I, 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 I'm probably going to forget a million of the story beats, but I loved that game casually. It might be the first one that actually passed FF9 for me on my casual Final Fantasy scale. of just I, I thought the game was fantastically done. The music, the story, the party members, the boss fights, uh, just like the themes of the, the story and everything. So, so well done. So, spoilers, I'm excited to talk about it today. Yeah, I remember when we were doing our FF9 episode, you were mentioning you're playing through 10 and you're doing you were just high on it. You were you were flying. Mm. I played this back on the PlayStation 2. Uh, I was, you know, a big PS1 Final Fantasy person. So, I you know, fell in love with it. I completed it back then when it came out and I played through it probably on the PS2 a couple more times and then on the the remasters, the the 10 10 2 hd remaster i did i've done three playthroughs on there and the first two were like i beat penance level of oh. of the game and it's called yojimbo i mean it wasn't like i was super skilled and did an hour long fight or anything but uh hey, you win <laughs> i i this playthrough specifically uh when i'm taking more notes and really focusing in on the game the gameplay I think it's probably my favorite turn-based battle system I've ever had. Uh, so good. It's phenomenal. Uh, it's the strategy, the way you move uh, party members in and out, the way that every battle feels kind of important. They don't feel like you're getting spammed. I, I'm a big fan yeah. on all of it. So, yes, I'm very big on 10. I even beat 10 2 one time. And <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like not as big on 10 2, but you liked it. You liked I've it. tried it multiple times to go back in. I'm like, no. Nah. And the first time I played it, I think I <laughs> used some sort of cheating device. I think I had like a Game Shark for my PS2. <laughs> Because I'm like, I just want to get to the end. You seem like the target audience for a game that is like very pop idol, concert centric, <laughs> and back massage minigame heavy. You know, like that just seems <laughs> like. <laughs> 
You would you would fit the bill for the the gamer that they're marketing to. You know the most perfect ending, the most tragic, heartbreaking tale of loss and uh, heartbreak, and you know giving it all to save the ones you love. Let's undermine it with a like three pop stars dancing around, and everyone's back to life. <laughs> And uh, major spoiler warnings for FF10-3, all of those sequel novella bullshit, which are canon, Sin does come back. Uh, it's unfortunate. What? <laughs> Somehow Sin has returned. Uh, yeah, but that's oh, no. a long ways from now. But yeah, so me, <laughs> personally, I'm very hot on it. Tyler, you might have the least experience. I definitely do. I've played through the game one time, and that was like two month a month ago two months ago something like that yeah it was recent but it was my first final fantasy game ever my uncle lived in arkansas and i lived in wisconsin right. and we used to go visit my grandparents and he had a playstation 2 and he had final fantasy 10 and it was the first time i played a game that wasn't madden or grand theft auto probably in my life <laughs> yeah so it, it definitely opened up my world to a whole different level of gaming it it broke the mold for a lot of people i had one buddy who was the exact same way uh blake and he he was like hey man I don't know how to play this game, but this the music is so good. Yeah, he was just like that <laughs> B-Said Island song when you're first exploring with Waka. He's oh. man, the soundtrack is great. Uh, but yeah, yeah, Blake was like, "How does RPGs work?" <laughs> I remember my <laughs> uncle coming in to see what I was up to because I would play in in his bedroom. And then he came in, he's like, let me see your sphere grid. And I was like, <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> and he's like, pull up your sphere grid. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because I'm like 11 at this time, 12 maybe. <laughs> and he's like, you haven't been leveling up? Like, you got all these, you level up. And I'm like, I don't, this looks like gibberish. I don't, what do you, yeah. What oh. do you mean? I can't do that. <laughs> I, which way do I go? Oh, the only way. Yeah. <laughs> and then as an adult beating this game, yes, there are parts of it that are a little cringy now and uh, a little dated. But as a kid, this was the most romantic, heartfelt <laughs> adult thing that I had ever experienced. And I had beaten Grand Theft Auto 3 like six times. You're saying this is more romantic than Grand Theft Auto 3? More romantic than getting health by banging hookers outside luigi's club yes <laughs> by far wow you and i have a different uh, concept of romance perhaps. <laughs> i feel like you got the i uh, got all three food groups of video games that exist though pretty early on like gta madden and final fantasy like that's it that's all there is so that's yeah. all the food groups you need. <laughs> no, nothing else is any good <laughs> dude i was i can't imagine ff10 being your like first rpg though oh like, it was you think about the like but I was really lucky growing up. My first RPG was Super Mario RPG. That is literally baby's first RPG. And even that was confusing for me. Like, wait, I'm not just running around and jumping on shit. What is happening here? Like, you know, oh, I have to like, I go, I select actions and I, you know, and I barely got through that. I can't imagine FF10, like you say, looking at the sphere grid and being like, what in the crap is this? Yeah. And the funny thing is I was most excited to play Blitzball because I played so much sports games growing up. Like I had March Madness back when that oh, was a sure. thing, college football, hockey. I had yeah. every sport. I would just, whenever it was season, I would play that year's game. And then this one kind of has sports kind of in it. And mm -hmm. at one point I get to play Blitzball. I was just waiting to get to that point the entire game. Now the as an adult who likes games now, well, I got to the Blitzball oh. part again and was like, this is fucking... This is like being waterboarded. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get to the blitz ball. Well, because this. because they, well, they, it's 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 a they dupe you, right? They're like, hey, we're gonna. This is actually like the facade of a sports game, but it's really just math. Like, you know, do some math. Yes, it really is. And it's, and it's got that math that I find frustrating with video games because I see the number thirteen as a block, and I expect a thirteen block, but there's also like that random like variable math that happens. Yup. And I'm a math guy, so when I, like, at least explain to me, well, and they do, but as a kid, I didn't understand that, like, it could vary. That could cut in half, and yada, yada, it's between these ranges. Yeah. I think that's, like, I, when you guys were doing FF9, like, I think that's a, a reason why a lot of people are not super high on Tetra Master, because it, it, the math yeah. works in the same way, right? Where if you have, uh, you know, a, an attacking card that has a three... And you, you know, duel with a card that has a defense of zero. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win, you know, 100 percent of the time. And then Blitzball's math kind of works in a similar ish way. And so, yeah, I think uh, when you're a kid, like 
it's really hard to understand. Like I, I know greater than and and less than, and I'm like, I don't I don't know about this inequality here. <laughs> I mean oh, what? it's yeah. like calculus doing blitz ball. As yeah. a thirty year old <laughs> as a thirty year old dude who graduated from college with a bachelor's degree, the math and blitz ball, those numbers might as well just be all bad. I'm not reading them, I'm not understanding them. It it's makes all no bad to me. <laughs> Just try to home run every time. Just run to the end zone every time and just pray the numbers work out. Yeah. I got a strategy. It's called give Titus the ball and do a jack shot. That is that is a strategy. Yeah, yeah. It's honestly, it, it's a pretty good strat. Yeah, I'll we'll carry you as long as you need. My years of FIFA have trained me to just be as close as possible to the goal before I shoot. So, Tyler, let's say we got a big game coming up, a big blitz ball game. We're the Beast State Oryx, and we're going up against the Luka Goers, the biggest ding-dongs in all of blitz ball. We need to be extra sharp for that game, don't we? Yeah, absolutely, because they bought their team. They bought their team. Yeah, uh, It's like Draco Malfoy's dad buying them all Nimbus 2001s. So exactly. You don't deserve those Nimbus 2001s, and the Luka Goers don't deserve to win. So what I think would be get a way to give us the, the cutting edge would be to use Magic Mind. I wholeheartedly agree. Magic Mind is a wonderful energy supplement. They're our sponsor for the show today. And it is an energy supplement. It keeps you focused and it keeps your eye on the goal, uh, especially in a giant sphere of water in Blitzball. Yeah, uh, it's going to keep you focused. It's going to keep you sharp. It's going to give you the competitive edge to help beat those the goers. Yeah, Magic Mind is... A little energy supplement. It's a little bottle of this delicious green matcha and adaptogens. There is a lot of all natural, wonderful ingredients. And what it does is it uh, focuses you in. It keeps your mind clear and sharp, and it helps you make it through the day without one of those uh, horrible crashes. But we want you to try Magic Mind. And if you're interested, we suggest that you use our special discount we can offer for our supporters, for our listeners today. Just go to www.patreon.com slash DC and use discount code DOGCAST20. That'll get you up to 56% off your first purchase. And we recommend the subscription. It's a great way to just uh, keep you moving throughout the month. And it's gotten to the point where... I, I mean, if I have a day without it, I feel it. Yeah, especially nowadays when it gets dark so early. It's yeah. easier to get that midday crash when the sun goes down at 3 o'clock. It really does. I don't like it. I go to work in the dark, and I come home in the dark, but my mind is clear. So go to www.patreon.com slash magicmind and use discount code DOGCAST20. Two both have extensive experience with ten. Yeah, this is I've I've actually this is the first time I've ever played the the HD version. I in in my like adulthood, I've kind of gotten into like the the trophy culture. I like getting trophies. I'm a, my PS yeah. and so I was like. Okay, I'll, I'll I'll do the PS4 version. I did. I bought, and it's funny. I bought it actually, like when it released. It, it came with uh, this. It came with a really pretty calendar for the year Ooh. 2015 um, with all these like <laughs> postcard arts that, yeah, I didn't even realize I had this, but oh, hey. I literally, I literally got it when it released and never fucking opened it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. We've um, all got shelves of that shit. Well, it, right? It's like, yeah. it, it's happened to me twice now where like they've released the 10 HD and then they released the nine HD and I get them both thinking, Oh, these are going to be like an hour shorter. I'll speed run these. And then I just fucking don't like I end up just yeah, doing right. the the original one anyway. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, I finally just played it on on the HD version for the first time. And um, I like that they had like the option to toggle between the original soundtrack and the like modern soundtrack. If you wanted to like, you know, kind of get a little uh, little bit of both. And uh I kind of liked that you could change the camera angle and stuff on the sphere grid. Like there were definitely some things on it that I was like, okay, I'm feeling this. It was good. 
Yeah, I was going to say, how do you feel like it's... Because you were asking, yeah, what's our experience? I've never played the PS2 version. I I did when I was a child at like, you know, a a, a game store. I'm pretty sure I played the first like hour. My mom must have dropped (laughs) me off for a long time. Um, But uh, yeah, other than that, like I I really didn't play it till, you know, this last year and a half or whatever. Uh, played the PS4 version. How do you think it stacks up to the original? Let's go. You like, I, they did a good job. I think that it's like, it's like one of those games that I think is actually fairly conducive of just upscaling the graphics more or yeah. less and just calling it a day. And I do think because it was a PS2 game and not a PS1 game that mm. of the like remasters of that era, I think it is easily the one that the upscaling is like the least jarring. Like I think it's the one with like the graphic update. Yeah looks the best whereas like on yeah, eight, on nine like some of the models look like they're kind of out of place on the condensed backgrounds like i think that some of the yeah. other ones don't quite look as nice and i playing the 10 i was like i think this actually looks pretty good yeah actually yeah. um with the hd remaster uh character models a lot of them were completely remade uh and there's a lot oh. of people that'll say the main characters like Titus and Yuna's faces are a little softer and more emotive in the PS2 version versus like a Botoxed out, like super <laughs> smooth HD. And the FMV cutscenes are cropped to widescreen because they could, you can, you know, everything else could be widescreen. You just have the game, but the cutscenes, they didn't want to go back in and do uh, that makes sense, like to remake them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. there's a number of cutscenes on the HD one where it's just like a close-up of Aaron's chest. And I'm there for that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I feel like this is... Um, someone got a haircut somewhere because this is very much just Lulu's cleavage. It's not being shy about it. Uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, some people actually don't have great feelings about the HD remaster. That's been the only way that I've really played it since the PS2. Like, yeah. I haven't gone back ever. I haven't played the original PlayStation 2 one since I was in high school. And honestly, I couldn't even tell you what it like. I don't really remember what it looked like, so I couldn't make a comparison. But I did. I do think the HD uh, Final Fantasy X on the PlayStation 4 actually looked pretty nice. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. it's always scary when you go back to those PlayStation 2 games that you have really fond memories of. And then they're like super fucking clunky and like not nearly as good as you remember. Um, yeah. That was pleasantly surprised with this one. I love NPCs that, oh, we don't have time to make you pretty. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there is just the, the guy with the worst face ever in like a close up for a few shots. Oh, sorry, Maester Kinnock. We didn't like you that much. <laughs> <laughs> You're not that crucial to the plot. I'm sorry. You have reminded me of one thing that I did notice playing this um, for the first time. Because I would like actually go around and talk to NPCs and like in this game, like, I think it's one of, like, at some point, like, FF7, or I guess when they started doing 3D models, like, you know, when you would talk to a character and that the NPC would turn on the axis to, like, face you, right? Like, rather than just having a 90-degree angle turn on a 2D game. And, like, so when I would talk to some of these NPCs, I would be kind of, like, in front of them, and the camera would be, you know, between, or the NPC would be between the camera and, and my character, and they would oh. turn. And I started to notice, I did not realize how many people in this game just have, like, full ass cheek out all the oh, time oh, yeah <laughs> no was, one should be allowed to dress themselves in that world like because on the p on the ps2 version on the ps2 version it for sure looks like pants like it looks like they just have like brown pants on and that there's like a flap that's like part of their shirt but i have learned that that is like actually their covering and it was just like full <laughs> ass cheek and i was just like huh did Asless, not know. Assless pants are very popular in Spira. Uh, yeah, it's, it's weirder to have your butt cheeks covered. Yeah, it's a, <laughs> it's a, it's disrespectful. Hi, we're 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 crusaders <laughs> fighting sin. Our arms have nice big armor. Oh, we're gonna have just brawn panties. Besides that, the mm-hmm. entire game. I've, we gotta protect them shoulders. Let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, man, Tetsuya Nomura. He's like, uh, hold my beer. We're gonna go off the deep end this time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he was testing his limits for sure. Between the the ash cheeks and Lulu's constant cleavage, I didn't realize how horny this game was. And I think I probably would have remembered that. Oh, yeah. I mean, as a kid, I remember like 
Ooh, which one do I want to be my girlfriend? Yeah, this is like a life or death decision. It's a most important decision. Yeah. And uh, as an old older man, it's definitely Lulu, but... <laughs> <laughs> but you're cultured enough, yes. Yeah, I'm cultured now. Uh, the blacker the clothing, the better is generally how I feel. Uh, but yeah, let's get into uh, some of the behind-the-scenes stuff before we jump into the game. Uh, development began in 1999. Sakaguchi, Hironobu Sakaguchi, was occupied with FF9 when this started, and he was starting the production of a little movie called The Spirits Within. Um, mm-hmm. Yoshinori Katase was the director of 7 and 8, so he became the producer of this game. Uh, he directed 6, 7, 8, Chrono Trigger, co-produced a ton of Kingdom Hearts, producer of both Remake and Rebirth. Katase, God. one of the big names uh, in Final Fantasy X. If it's a good one, he was, had his hands in it, probably. Uh, budget of $32 million, about $57 million today, with a team of more than 100 people. Much of the two-year development time was just trying to figure out how to utilize the PS2 system. There were a lot of things that they didn't have a chance to properly implement. They did want to do a world map. They wanted more mini-games, but they uh, unfortunately didn't have the time. And uh, yeah, so started back in 1999. Story by... Kazushige Nojima, uh, head, head script writer, he does uh, most of the stories, seven and eight. I don't know which other ones he, he's all done, but he's also responsible for the deep end stuff of like Dirge of Cerberus, um, Before Crisis, Advent Children. He likes the video games. They're so good. And then the extended world just really gets out there. I don't know if you guys do any extended like FF10 or like any of the novellas for the other games. I haven't. I, I, I have not personally touched any of them, no. Yeah. I feel like I have tried to stay on the main line because you start rearing off on Final Fantasy. It's a little weird. Man, I mean, Titus canonically, when he dies, he goes to a mobile game. Like, that's just canon. <laughs> <laughs> that's called Purgatory. That's, that's, that's called where, Purgatory. That's, where, that's Purgatory, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm on a mobile game. <laughs> listen, listen, all right? When this game came out and I finished it for the first time and and he disappeared, I knew in 20 years to bring him back, I was microtransactions were the answer. Like <laughs> yeah. there was there was never a shred of doubt in my mind. Yeah, more powerful than a Phoenix down. All it takes is a few yeah. microtransactions and I am alive again. That's why you can't say you can't save Aerith and FF7 is that like that we weren't quite there yet, you know? Yeah. They didn't have the foresight to realize that it was it was Oh pay. my god. We're about to save her in rebirth with microtransactions. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get the save Aerith DLC, dude. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> what is a life worth to you? Five ninety nine. <laughs> Uh, yes, we mentioned Tetsuya Nomura did the character design. He was less involved in the story than some people think. Mostly, he's like, give this man some later hosen and an Ellen DeGeneres haircut, and we're just going to wipe our hands and walk away. <laughs> also, though, I mean, uh, all jokes aside, Aaron is one of the most badass characters I've ever seen. Oh, yeah. Like, a lot of really great character design, but also just some outlandish and garish stuff in this. I spent an entire day with my arm in my jacket like him, and my parents were like, the fuck are you doing? And I was like, you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't get it. <laughs> was, Spike, was your, first, was your first experience with Oren playing Kingdom Hearts? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you, no, did you I, think he was fucking cool? Like, were you like, this guy fucking rules? Yeah, this guy, <laughs> dude, he's the absolute coolest character in, in Kingdom Hearts 2. Because Hades is like, all right, let me bring this guy back from the dead. And, uh, you know, Orin pops up. I forgot, I'm going to not do the line justice. But he, he's like, I am the ruler of the underworld. Now I see why no one wants to die. And in Kingdom Hearts, oh. that's the most badass fucking line <laughs> you're going to ever hear, I swear to God. I was like, Orin is so cool. There's, I, I'm part of a generation of a lot of Final Fantasy characters. First time I saw Squall, he was in Kingdom Hearts. His name was Leon. So you thought he was Leon for some amount of time. For so long. I was like, his name's Leon. That's his name. Yeah, yeah, First time seeing Cloud, his Kingdom Hearts 1 design, which is badass, by the way. Yeah, those, the, they actually, the, all, of, all three of those characters, they actually do a pretty good job with. I just thought, like, I had played Kingdom Hearts 2, like, way after it had been out. Like, I think the like Kingdom Hearts 3 and a ton of the other games were already uh, out when I had finally played Kingdom Hearts 2. And I just remember being like, I thought that the way they integrated Oren was like incredibly apt. Like it was just like a really 
strong way to use Orin's like character arc from Final Fantasy Aww. 10 and in kind of embed it into the like Her- Hercules Kingdom Hearts lore. Yeah. I, was, I, I was just wondering if that was the first time you'd ever seen Orin. Yeah, okay. it's like such an underrated part of like Kingdom Hearts, like early Kingdom Hearts. Of course, Kingdom Hearts 3, they're like, ah, eh, screw it. We're, <laughs> we're not going to have any more uh, Final Fantasy Microtransactions, DLC. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. what we're going to do. But like, yeah, I, I 100% agree. Like, because for the most part, I know this is not a Kingdom Hearts episode we're talking about, but like, it can fall into just like, oh, it just feels like super watered down versions of the Disney movies that we watched as kids, yada, yada. But like you said, that implementation of Orin now playing FF10 last year, I was like, wow, they actually did a really good job of seeing how these could connect together. I was very impressive in retrospect, not being an FF10 head. But yes, back to the original point, Orin. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't trying to like derail the conversation, but I was just like, I feel like this is a time that I could ask. Oh no, yeah, yeah, so, trust me, I, I've been on enough of these. They they love they love the derailings. It's great. The, the just- derailings are good. Oh no, listen, <laughs> listen, listen. I listened to a couple episodes, and I've, I've I've been sitting on something that I I actually am not sure if it's a thing or if this was just a one time thing. But I'm just just wait. All right, I'm. Ah, it's up here. Right? I like the tease. I like the tease. And we're going to talk about the hairdressers and Spira for a while when we get to Waka as well. There is time <laughs> for, for derailing. Originally, the the working script was called 17, the number, 7 space teen, the words. So it was 1717. Was the working That's uh, like, title. It's what? like Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> That's what they were like referring to it as. Yeah, Macaulay, Macaulay Ma- Culkin Culkin. Ma- yeah, Macaulay, yeah, Macaulay Culkin. <laughs> Macaulay, Macaulay Culkin Culkin. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The hero traveled the world seeking a cure for a pandemic that killed people when they reached the age of 17. Uh, Yuna would have been a Red Cross-like nurse. And you would learn your treatment was actually causing the people's deaths in the game. (laughs) (laughs) Getting their spirits to move on. What the hell? Yeah. uh, Death was a a recurring motif. Uh, Tetsuya Nomura identified the South Pacific, Thailand, and Japan as influences on the the cultural and geographic design of Spira. Mm -hmm. It's very much an Mm -hmm. island game. Yeah, for sure. I, I love that. Uh, Titus, this was, yeah, this is a fun fact. Titus was originally going to be a plumber. Oh, our second great plumber in gaming almost happened. Yeah, we yeah. were so close. And Luigi's just super mad that you said the second great. Mm. I feel like, I feel like they were oh, like, shit. I, I feel like they sat no more down. They're like, bro, listen, you remember that <laughs> Spirits Within debacle? We need to change some of this shit, bro. You can <laughs> like, have <yeah>. Lulu's <laughs> belts or the plumber. You can't have both of these things. Yeah, yeah, you <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a rags to riches story too. Like Titus goes from plumber to like LeBron James. Essentially. Yeah, he's literally messy. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't well, want to no, first, 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 I don't want to jump too far ahead. But he says he's LeBron James. But then whenever we get to Spira, he's like kind of like insanely below average. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Stats. <are laughs> Well, it was a different time. You know, you take the football players from the 50s, try and have them play today. They don't have the steroids. Yeah, that, that, that's for sure what it is. That's, that's got to be. Con- uh, <laughs> they're all concussed and that's drunk. That's a way to figure Yeah. <laughs> uh, originally a plumber. Uh, that would connect with the underwater elements of the game, but they instead opted for star athlete, oh. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we got there, but all right, it works. Well, um, he would have the attitude of a delinquent, it was said as well. Uh, and Nomura said some of the plumber elements remain in his costume design. And I'm like, which ones, man? Like, what are we talking about here? I, I, I know several plumbers. I know several plumbers that wear pants. I got I to gotta see what he's wearing. You just got to cut off like half of one of your pant legs and then you're basically a plumber. I guess so. Yeah. I, maybe. Maybe the maybe the yellow boots he's wearing or something or like a little bit. I, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to see in there. Well, he's got a water <laughs> sword. Well, that's not from his uh, original story, though. That's, that's Waka's true. brother's sword. And, but the little net thing on his sleeve, it could be a basketball net or it could be like a drain net. If there was like food. all of a sudden a plunger that I never noticed, then I would 
Give it credence. Right. <laughs> oh, I never noticed he's got a tattoo of a plunger on him. All right, there he is. Uh, he was originally going to be an unsent in the game, but after the Sixth Sense came out, they're like, we shouldn't have him be unsent like every uh, other character in the game. Like, son of a bitch. They stole our idea. I'm just picturing Titus, like, trying to, like, plunge a toilet that's clogged and his dad just walking in be up and being like, you can't do it, kid. And he's just, like, <laughs> going in on this toilet. Dude, I feel like the there's so many layers to him back. being a plumber that I think would actually make this game like one of the greatest comedies of all time. <laughs> the The fact that that plot would have been eerily close to the Mario Brothers movie, uh, a plumber gets sucked <laughs> oh, into yeah. an alternate dimension world. Right. <laughs> I wish. Uh, one of the, okay, the now, weird what ifs. Uh, Y'all lost me there for a second, but now I, I wish this had been the plot. God damn. Well, and then he arrives and he's like, oh, no, I'm a star blitzball player for sure. <laughs> and he that'd be funny because yeah. he had to just pretend that he knew what he was doing the whole time. But he's just a plumber. <laughs> and they're like, hey, man, you're not really good at this whole blitzball thing. And then he's like, well, that was a thousand years ago and I'm really rusty. We have different rules where I'm from. <laughs> uh, I came into contact with Sin's Toxin and uh, it also depletes your blitzball ability. I bet you didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have issues, man. Go easy on me. I don't fancy 10 to Zack Snyder. I want <laughs> I'm there. I'm there for it. Uh, first, uh, first Final Fantasy game with fully three-dimensional areas. First to feature voice acting to mostly... Um, Mostly good outcomes, I would say. You know how mm -hmm. disappointed I was when I was like, wait, it's Final Fantasy X? They're like, no, it's 10. And I was like, so there's nine more of these baller-ass <laughs> video games that look and sound exactly like this that I'm going to get to enjoy? And then my uncle's like, nah. He's like, just nah. let's work they're on the sphere grid first yeah, there, buddy. They're very 2D. Yeah. <laughs> One of the common criticisms I'll hear from people about the voice acting isn't like necessarily that they think the voice acting is inherently like bad or that the voice actors were like poor choices. But like people are often fine, like it can be a little bit jarring that uh, the English voice acting lines don't at all match up with the lip movements of the characters. And it's because yeah. they, they designed them all for the Japanese voice actors. And then when they recorded them, they just basically like edited the script for the English lines so that they could try to fit the lip movements that they had already designed yeah. as closely as possible. Which is why there will be some lines where like they'll say like, like there's one line where Waka's like, even in... Death, yeah, because there's like kind of like a weird <laughs> mouth pause. And so they they kind of had the like, yeah. And so like a lot of people find that a little jarring. But I think if you like understand that that was like a limitation, like it would have been a massive amount of work to redo all of the mouth oh, movements yeah. for, you know, localization. And so I think they actually did like a pretty good job of making it work like under those conditions. So I find the voice acting really impressive for 2000. You know? Yeah, yeah for, I, I, I'm in that boat that like after Metal Gear Solid in 1998 and its voice performances, I thought this was the next real step up in voice acting quality in video games. Like 2001, how did they do this, anyways? No, it's the it was the Wild West back then, and you know now they can just match lip movements for the characters for whatever language they're speaking, yeah. and. The way that the game engine was triggering sound files was tied into the same system used to trigger action on the screen. So if a sound file went overboard even half a second, it could throw off the entire scene and crash the game. So that was another limitation that they had to work with. They couldn't, like, say things longer. They had to kind of keep the files the same length. And, yeah, wow. trying to match, match up the audio, sometimes the... The sound editors would digitally speed up or slow down the clips to fill the speaking time. And the fact that <laughs> I couldn't really notice that, I think, is uh, That's, credit. It's it's one of those things that, like, until you hear them a lot of times, and, like, once you notice it on one line, once, you will hear it for fucking ever. <laughs> <laughs> but even, even more difficult, they didn't have the final cinematics to match the lips to. They had to listen to the Japanese audio and try and match the cadence to that, mm. not seeing the cutscenes at all. Fucking that I did insane. not know, but that is, that, that's, oh. that's impressive, honestly. That's a tall task. As, yeah, as a former actor, like, I, and I didn't do voice acting or anything, that sounds 
a little toxic. That sounds <laughs> awful as an actor. Like, none of, like, your time spent design should be like, all right, what is my character? What are they experiencing right now? What are they trying to do to other characters? And all this stuff. Not like, shit, all right, what is the cadence of this other language to, like, <laughs> sort of piece this all together? That Kudos to the voice actors for, like, doing it at all. Especially because a lot of things don't have like a one to one translation in, in even how like people emote language, you know, across languages. Uh-huh. And so I feel like even just that notion would be really difficult to make work. Yeah. Yeah. The scripting, the voice acting. Yeah, it's tough. Uh, the cutscene of Titus and Yuna kissing was developed by Visual Works, a subsidiary. Uh, many animators weren't experienced with romance scenes. Uh, <laughs> so the animators sought younger staff as well as female members, and they were all very <laughs> unimpressed with their concept of a romance scene. And they, <laughs> they uh, had to change uh, most of it around. Uh, because the ladies are like, this is not romantic. <laughs> that is the most like that is the most video game nerd thing I have ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> yeah, we had a bunch of nerdy developers, and they would they had to try to make a believable romance scene, and nobody fucking knew how to do it. Like, like <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know what this looks like. I'm sorry. <laughs> they just sat down the staff, and they're like, okay, well, thanks for your help on the romance scene, but while we got you here, can you explain exactly where the clitoris is <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> while we're here? <laughs> So it well, saved me like, a lot of time. <laughs> I remember, again, I didn't play this as a kid, but like I had friends on the playground who were like, yeah. And then all of a sudden there's a makeout scene. And I was like, what? They're like, no, no, no. There's like, they kiss and everything. And as someone who played nine and I knew of seven and eight, there were love interests and love stories in those games, but they really never had like a scene dedicated to even a kiss or anything in those games. So hearing FF10 like went for it there, I went, oh, does it look dumb as shit? I wondered genuinely as a kid. Finally seeing as an adult, they did good. Are you saying taking your love interest, forcing her underwater, and spinning her around a bunch isn't romantic? Like, that? I just love that Titus takes her underwater oh, for a long yeah. makeout scene. I'm like, she can't breathe underwater, dude. This has been <laughs> She's talked about in the lore. You Take Waka down there and have some fun. But <laughs> hey, li- Listen, listen. Final Fantasy set the bar for romance scenes really high when they did Final Fantasy VI, and they show a scene that demonstrates how Terra was conceived and born, in which they have a human woman and a summon (laughs) dance around in the stars, and then the two stars touch each other and the baby is born so like i, I feel like this is this is okay i'm i'm, I'm okay with this uh, yeah, they, yeah, so yeah, they've yeah. been trailblazers for a while in the world of romance <laughs> now i mean the enlightened also know when tifa and cloud went to bed in the chocobo spot on the, the airship i know what was going down <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> i can read between the lines you don't go out to the hay pile just to go have a roll in the hay or does tifa like roll over and be like you can call me Aerith if you want like <laughs> <laughs> That's why Cloud doesn't talk. He knows he's going to say it wrong if he talks too yeah. much. <laughs> Just keep my mouth shut. There is shit. They originally wanted to have Play Online involved in this game as well, but after the Thank tragedy fuck. of FF9, <laughs> God. Uh, they decided not to, thankfully. The battle art director, Shintaro Takai, wanted enemies to be visible on the field with seamless transitions into battles. Mm. The PS2 was not ready for that yet. Uh, yeah, also they wanted characters to move during enemy, enemy encounters. They would move around instead of just have their spot and, you know, move forward. Mm. Interesting. And the sphere grid was created to give players an interactive means of increasing character attributes such that they will be able to observe the development. Oh, so good. We're going to take a quick break here from another amazing show from the Tokyo Bee Podcast Network, and we'll be right back. Spaceships, magic swords, intergalactic empires, dead gods, and creatures from beyond the moon. What mad universe could contain all these fantastic visions? What mad universe is a bi-weekly podcast delving into the misty origins of sci-fi and fantasy, pop culture and genre tropes. Take a cosmic trip on What Mad Universe Podcast, now on the Tokyo Beat Podcast Network. Today's show is brought to you by Epos Gaming Audio. With a comprehensive lineup of both wired and wireless headsets, gaming amplifiers, microphones, and webcams, Epos has everything you need to experience the power of audio. 
like their H6 Pro lineup, which features two versions, an open or closed headset. The closed headset allows you to tap into exceptionally detailed audio and seals out ambient noise, while the open version delivers natural high fidelity audio with an incredible soundstage. Both headsets include a magnetic detachable microphone and a sleek design that has no wild RGB configurations, just good design. Listeners can save 15% by visiting www.eposaudio.com slash gaming and entering code EPOS friend 15 at checkout. That is EPOS friend 15 at checkout. I must say, this might be one of my favorite soundtracks of any Final Fantasy game. Hell yeah. In gaming history, it's so good. Every track is a banger, whether it's the battle themes, the town themes, a character theme. How about Otherworld? It's a banger. A little gacked? Hell yeah. Uh, not gacked, actually. Wait, 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 no, no, I think... You're thinking of the character from... From... I'm trying to... Gacked is a song in, like, Crisis Dirge Core. of Cerberus or something. Or maybe maybe it's Crisis Core. Yeah, He's yeah. a character in Crisis Core and Dirge of Cerberus, but he, I think he has a song. Oh, yeah. They brought in a Christian metal vocalist to do... Uh, that song for Otherworld, actually. <laughs> they brought in Aaron Gillespie <laughs> from Underoath. <laughs> I wish. As the, the only Christian. Yeah. They brought in Scott like Stapp of Creed. Oh, my He's God. He's like, all right, now the, that was the Final Fantasy song. Now here's uh, Boy Brush in Red. <laughs> <laughs> uh, composed by Nobuo Uematsu, the goat, again. Uh, but yeah. uh, So essentially, there's like a rule. If there's a song that's got a catchy melody... That means Uematsu did it, but it was also uh, composed by Masashi Hamazu, uh, Hamauzu, and Junya Nakano. Now, there is a lot of just super atmospheric, like kind of setting the, the scene more than giving you like uh, a song, like a melody that you can like hum to yourself. They just have uh, like one that's just like the sounds of wind changing, and there's a guy playing saxophone in the background. I'm like, who the fuck is this? <laughs> I, I love that as much as Uematsu. Um, mm -hmm. Some of those just like weird ass atmospheric music. I, yeah. I'm there for it. Plus, you also have you know Nobuo doing like those super memorable like spirit themes and Suteki Dane. But I just like that there's uh, some mix up. I'm a huge fan of the music in this game. Yep. That's yeah. one of the first things I, I noticed with just about every game that I really enjoy is that the soundtrack is usually really good. It's like, I don't know, it kind of sets the plate for me. Mm -hmm. Cause I, mm -hmm. I've said that about all of my favorite games lately. This one kind of reminded me of how quickly I identified that like the Hades soundtrack, which mm -hmm. would go on to be one of my favorite games was just an absolute banger. Yeah. You find good music that can really like drive the action of whether it's gameplay or just an important, you know, scene in a video game or anything. That's where my nostalgia buttons in my brain go off the most. It's seeing like, you know, for me till the day I die, I'm always going to remember, you know, Zidane and you are not alone from, you know, near the end of Final Fantasy IX. It's as soon as that track landed, that did it. I will forever remember first having, you know, Titus, Titus, whatever, wash up on the shore of Besaid and that, that endlessly peaceful town theme uh, coming into my head right there is, is, is so good. Is, is so good. And Seymour walks on screen in the most ominous harp you've ever heard. I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh yeah. it's a... It's a bad guy. <laughs> Dude, mm -hmm. they really want That's you to know who the guy. bad guy is, like, <laughs> immediately. <laughs> right. <laughs> he kind of looked like Sephiroth, don't he? Yeah. And, like, you're like, they're not even like, this is the bait, guys. Take the bait. It's right. like, no, this yeah. is the fucking bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was zero doubt with that uh, deep V-cut robe that he's wearing. <laughs> with yeah. his spiky hair and his coke nail. I like when they show Little Seymour and he's got the same stupid hair but a smaller version of it. <laughs> <laughs> is he, isn't he wearing a hat for the wedding? Is he wearing a little hat? He has like a little thing I on. Yeah, say, yeah, he has like a little. It, yeah, yeah, it yeah. He takes his little uh, horns and he ties them back. <laughs> oh, it's so wild. When did a some, when did something about Mary come out? After Waka. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Before Waka. Oh. Who came first? Something Walker. about Mary feels 1990. It's, it's like late 90s. Yeah, I know this. Big, 
I so Lockett was yeah. inspired by something about I me. that's what I'm thinking. That's yeah. <laughs> Lots of hair gel yeah. was used in the making of this game. Do you just imagine Waka like on every break, just like just combing his hair, <laughs> just like yeah. <laughs> Okay, perfect. <laughs> I just no, no, no. He's he's just like he has to psych himself up to be a good be a good person. You know, he's just sitting there combing his hair for an hour. He's right. just like, "Fuck the bet in Machina. That shit's so bad. <laughs> that shit's so bad. I'm never buying a hair dryer. That's against my religion. <laughs> Unless it's for a Blitzball arena, everyone agrees Blitzball is fine. We're not going to question that right. technology." <laughs> This game was a critical and commercial success, shipped over 8.5 million units on the PlayStation 2. Uh, First PS2 game to reach 2 million and 4 million sold copies. Uh, Only one uh, major naysayer, uh, Edge Magazine, described the dialogue as nauseating, particularly Titus. Everybody else was super hot in the game. Um, I I echo some of those sentiments, but... uh, I, I'm okay with Titus. I would be fine without him. Well, and if, I mean, now knowing what I know about the dialogue and how they were recording it and trying to make the English version, like, it's a Japanese game. It probably is natively better in Japanese. And like sure. you said, there's not always a one-to-one translation to what they are saying in Japanese versus what you got to say in English. Yeah, like, um, they had to add a lot of yaws to Waka to, like, space out his dialogue. Which accidentally almost made him racist. Well, that, no, I think it was him being racist that made him racist. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was intentional. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on with Waka. Yo, I believe in that religion, yeah. I'm going to throw a blitz ball at my god, yeah. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Waka, you, you, you are the most likable guy because you're John DiMaggio, but you are pushing a lot of buttons right now, dude. <laughs> Listen, he got by in my playthrough by, you know, you've got this. You're fine. This is the, the beauty of video games, right? You're fighting a god. You're fighting this thing that's apocalyptic, destroying everything. And I'm going to take him down with a fucking beach ball. Because he, he was my big attacker. He got that fat sphere grid. Him throwing that ball for like 9999 every time, it was so good. It was so good. Version differences, the Japanese game released with a bonus disc featuring interviews, storyboards, and trailers. The international version released in January of 02, introducing the Dark Aeons, Penance, um, the Eternal Calm, which was a 14-minute video leading to 10-2, and some other minor things like Yojimbo's motivation formula and some characters' HPs were moved around. The HD remaster came in December of 2012 for the 10-year anniversary we went over some of those changes. The remaster then came to PS4 May 2015. The Windows version does have autosave, five game boosters, skip FMVs, and 4K support. Uh, as a console player, that sounds nice. Did they always <laughs> do the behind-the-scenes interviews and shit for Final Fantasy, Fantasy games, or was that fairly new for ten? I don't know. I think this was the first one because the PS2 was when they started putting the games on DVD discs. And I think yeah. that they, they just are more conducive. There's way more space. And I think just they probably play media like that, I guess, a little bit better, more likely. Um, uh, so they I'm sure those things exist, but I don't I, I, I have most of the versions of seven, eight and nine that exist. And I don't think the the closest thing to like bonus content is that the seven international JP version comes with a disc that has like a guide for like it's called the perfect game guide and it, it's it's pretty imperfect but but it does exist. <laughs> <laughs> it gets across the finish line. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember like Lunar the Silver Star story for the PS One had a bonus disc with some making of, which was fascinating to me as a kid. But no, uh, I don't I don't know for Final Fantasies until this game where I could be like, yo. I thought Lulu looked different than that. It just, it, <laughs> it kind of further makes me think that they really knew they were onto something with the making of this game. Yes. Yeah. 
I mean, to go through all of that trouble of recording all of that and shipping it out with the game, like if that game bombs, it's like you just you just made a documentary of your shit sandwich. I mean, I want a no clip documentary of the Gollum game. I would love to oh, watch. That'd be so good. <laughs> How the fuck did this happen, man? That's been moving in and out of my cart so much over these Black Friday sales because it's ten bucks, <laughs> and I love I love bad games, and I just I haven't pulled the trigger yet. I think I'm gonna give copies of that to all of my loved ones for Christmas this year. <laughs> Secret Santa. It's just fourteen copies of Gollum. I love it. <laughs> You're like you guys know what you know what's you know what's fucking awesome. This game here. Enjoy this. <laughs> you're gonna love. You're gonna love, love it. it. Hey, you oh, like Lord you're of the big Rings, Lord right? of the Rings fan. Oh my god, you're gonna love this. Uh, exploration for this game: third person perspective, mostly a fixed camera. Uh, navigate the main character, interact with objects and people. No top-down perspective world map. Regions and their connections are mostly linear. Your first playthrough, uh, you do receive an airship. Now let's talk about the battles, which were designed by Toshiro Sushida. I mentioned before, I fucking love this battle system. Uh, this yeah. is this is my jam. This is why I really had a problem jumping back into Final Fantasy with like 15 was the first one I'd played in a while. And they switched to the new combat system, and I was like, no. I want the turn-based. <laughs> I want it back. I want it now. I don't like this. But 10 is fantastic. Yeah. Oh, man. Con- conditional turn-based battles, uh, it's, it pushes strategy so much yeah. and it also makes support characters super relevant yes. where like titus is this weird like almost time mage the fact that he has all of these abilities to delay or speed up attacks yeah uh that's something i didn't appreciate back then but just the way that you you can see you know on that top right you see who's coming up in what order and oh man i would just manipulate that to no end it was satisfying to look up and see what that turn order was going to be. And that, like, one of my favorite, just about any ma- magic spell in any of these games has always been a haste or a slow. But you never felt the weight of that in older turn based Final Fantasies that, like, would it net even gain you an extra turn anywhere? I love that at the core of all of this that makes the combat system so fun is are those haste and slow spells. And making Titus not just like the buff character as the main character, like, no, that is the primary thing that he governs on his part of the grid. And you can make you just look up there, ah, oh, yeah, I've got four turns with Waka coming up right now before the boss comes up. And knowing what that turn order is going to be, being able to, like you say, strategize ahead exactly how you want to handle everybody's turns. So, so cool. Now, this was my first time doing the Expert Sphere Grid on the HD remaster. Oh, yeah. Have any of you done the Expert Sphere Grid? I, I thought about it, and then I was like, I, I'm just going to do the normal one. So I, I, I did not do it. I actually don't I, even know what the difference is. Yeah, I have not done it either, but what my chat explained me, because I asked them, I was like, should I do the extra one or the other one? They were like, yeah, do the original one first. I guess the basic concept is instead of you got your big sphere grid map and everybody's off on their different corners, and in the center was Kamari, who is like your blue mage. You can kind of send whatever direction you want. Everybody starts in the middle. And so you can make everybody... Whatever you you want to make Titus a black mage, send him down the black mage path. It might not work that well, but you can do whatever you want with it. That sounds really enticing. Funny run. The speed run actually doesn't use the expert grid. You think? I, I mean, I can see why it's it's not the original version of the game, which just that alone makes me feel like icky about it. Uh, this is my first time doing it, and I loved it. I was expecting to be super against it. Uh, what I wound up doing, though, is most like to get Yuna and Lulu to be able to get the Lancet ability so they can just steal MP from enemies. Uh-huh. <laughs> Game breaking. Oh, Game yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. That was the most important thing. Otherwise, a few different characters got delay attack. And then, yeah, they all start in the middle. And then everyone that's around Auron, they would just jump over, grab 12 strength abilities, that are, like yeah. attributes, and just jump right back over. Essentially, uh-huh. if you were an attacker... Just get down to orange a little bit. But yeah. yeah, once you start moving, they do kind of go down their different paths, but you can kind of jump between them pretty easily in the expert. And I also spent more time kind of going around to get everyone a few of the basic abilities first. And I wound up having not 
any of the strong stuff when I needed it. Oh yeah. I didn't have Cura. I didn't have Cura when I needed it. I didn't have Ooh. Fyra or any of like the bigger abilities, which made the battles more difficult, which made them more fun. I actually wound up dying a few times, which generally doesn't happen in Final Fantasy games, but I kind of appreciated the the bigger challenge. Having less of the stronger abilities I found to be pretty nice actually. Yeah. All the characters start in the middle essentially is the difference and you can uh mm. there's less nodes. So there's less stat upgrades, but unless you're a monster, completing a sphere grid uh, doesn't make too big of a difference. <laughs> I got to the end of my playthrough. People were like, do you think you'll go finish the sphere grid? Which you like practically do to fight any like the dark aeons or anything. I, was, I, I zoomed that map out. I was like, God, no, are you <laughs> kidding me? I thought they just meant everybody completes their chunk. No, everybody does the whole thing. I'm like, that, that must take years. Maybe when they wrote that achievement, that's what they meant. And then the person who was implementing it is like, okay, they must complete the entire sphere grid. And those achievements are kind of mean too, because it's not just get all of the nodes. You have to get max stats and there has to be like, you have to add yeah. nodes. It's very cruel. Yeah. In specific spots to like get your luck upgrades and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, before the sphere grid though, they originally were considering a tattoo system where you would have an open grid. Far Cry 3. I've never played Far Cry 3, but you get tattoos in that game to get abilities? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like the... Oh! It looks like kind of like the Sphere Grid, but you get tattoos and it works up the wrist, and you can see it because it's a first-person shooter. You can see your arm in the in your field of view. So as the game goes on, it's badass as fuck because your arm just fills up with tattoos, and by the end, you're just like a war machine. Well, I mean... That's sick. I think tattoos look cool. Yeah, I would have loved <laughs> just like... Stay awake, tattooed under Titus's eyes like Post Malone. <laughs> <laughs> he would maybe look cooler if he had some tattoos. He's got a claymore on the side of his head. No, he would get a <laughs> neck tattoo. It just says, fuck my dad. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Mama's boy. Piece of shit. Yeah. His mom does seem like a very sweet lady, in fairness. So there's, you know. <laughs> All they had to do was just shave Titus's head, and I think it would have gone a long way. <laughs> Give this guy a number two. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> didn't like him looking like Ellen DeGeneres back in... Man, it, that it Meg all, Ryan. It aged... It, yeah, Meg Ryan. It all just it aged better. I can understand, because I remember a lot of people critic, like just thinking this game was weird back in 2002, but in 2020, this shit hits, dude. This shit's real good. Oh, yeah. I'm glad I waited until I was an adult. Yeah, uh, originally you would place tattoos to boost stats and abilities. Seymour, Jekt, and Brother still have the original tattoos designed for their characters. Mm. Um, yep. Nobody else gets cool tattoos, though. <laughs> and you would also uh, acquire items and improve your characters through that system as well. Uh, we already know about the characters' standard grids. Titus is going to be speedy. Aaron is your beast. Uh Aaron gets so overpowered so quickly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does. Uh, I got to a point this playthrough where Aaron was the only person, like, everyone help Aaron and just stay out of his way. Yeah. See, I, right. That, that yeah. was Waka for me. Waka was just like, he can hit anything. He's usually, <sighs> and he's fast. He usually appears pretty high in the order. Yeah, I, I think I kind of took that approach. I was like, Oren is just default. Every node's like plus four attack. I gave like my big stuff, like the 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 extra strength node to Waka so they would both hit hard, yeah. Yeah, Waka's, Waka's legit. And uh, ranged attacks. I mean, the characters really do have defined roles. And when people want to argue about Final Fantasy games, they um, often argue about job systems and like... Kind of like the Materia system in 7. Any character can wind up being anybody. But with the classic Sphere Grid, I do like the defined roles that the characters fall into. It makes everybody super important outside of Kamari. Right. Kamari Kamari's your classic blue mage where they're really, really strong if you have a good plan for them. I think the one thing that they that they like added to this combat that I think makes having kind of each character have a specific typecasted role really useful is that w the fact that they added like the tap in tap out system of your characters. Yeah. So it's not like you only have your party of three characters like all of the games that came before it. And so you do kind of have like the uh, the ability to have characters like there, uh, 
I, I will usually lead with whichever characters have initiative on their weapon or equipment or have just the highest speed because they're usually going to get the turns first, even if it's not the character I want to use because they will outspeed the enemy and I can tap in yeah. who I actually want to uh. use who's slower. And so I think that like having kind of like the character rules makes that added la like layer of, of combat strategy a little bit more interesting um, just because mm. you can use your entire party, so to speak, you know? Which is kind yeah, of cool. it's got great flow. This is someone could grab me. I think this was the first Final Fantasy where you could swap your main character out. I think it, it was always a limitation. I, like I think Cloud's got to be in the party. Yeah, yeah. Zidane, Squall, they all got to be in the party. All of a sudden, no, Tidus can go on the bench if you want. I thought that was extremely cool. I like it that they even go further in 12 where I'm like, oh, now it is just both here as the main character for the entire game. He is oh, the leading right. man. <laughs> it, yeah, the, just the way you switch, the way you switch uh, your characters in and out, and it's so fast. You're not penalized for it. I love yep. it so much. Yeah, and that yep. combined with everybody's pretty uh, well thought out role actually made it feel like when I was strategizing and I did something good that I was actually smart. Like, oh, I fucking <laughs> yeah. nailed that because <laughs> yeah. the game yeah. just intuitively makes sense to you. And that is nice, like, after playing, like, Gotham Knights recently, where, like, nothing is really fucking explained, and I'm just mashing a button, to actually have a game that has strategy and make you feel smart. Yeah, I like that. Combat system does super super well is that I, I am not a grinder in RPGs whatsoever. I'm like, ah, eh, whatever level I get, I'm gonna go. Maybe it's like a byproduct of being a speedrunner, but I'm like, I think grinding is just not the most fun way for me to play a game. But there's a lot of a lot of people are into that. I like that in this. There's the benefit of you don't just leave other characters behind. Oh, I got to do a round with these three. Then I got to do a round of fights with these three. It's not, as long as you swap them into a fight, they will get the same amount of experience towards upgrading their sphere system or whatever. It actually, not only does it, okay, everybody gets experience now. It naturally pushes you as a player to get everybody into, especially all the boss fights, to say, okay, uh, I gotta get, uh, I gotta get Riku in here somehow, and think about how does she help me achieve defeating this boss that's on screen right now. So she's leveling up, but also like just be more correct in the strategy department. Yep, Riku must steal from everybody once before she is swapped out yep. for Orin. <laughs> I uh, in my playthrough, I was trying to kill. It as many bosses as possible using spare change on the final turn and just throwing money oh, and throwing yeah. money at them. <laughs> <laughs> With spare change, if the boss has less HP, does it require less gil? Uh, it, it, it does one damage for every 10 gil you throw. And I would always just throw 69,690 because I'm a loser. But <laughs> <laughs> right, you got to. <laughs> It's actually kind of like, it's a strat in the speed run, I'm pretty sure. Like, that's how they kill all the Aeons at the, oh, spoilers, yeah, <laughs> at yeah, the yeah. end of the game. Just throw money just at them. Just cash at them. It's a, good, yeah. it's a good metaphor for how you deal with problems in life, you know? Just throw right. some fucking money at <laughs> them. Yeah, right. <laughs> There's some money. Um, Make it hell. But, hey, I'm, I'm glad to hear that you guys like the battle system in Final Fantasy X, because let me tell you, if you like Lord of the Rings... There's this game called Lord of the Rings, the third age, which is also for the, for the PlayStation two. Oh, I That's know the same fucking thing. And it rules. <laughs> it's literally the really? same. They basically just take the final fantasy 10 combat almost exactly. And they're like, we're just going to put a Lord of the Rings skin on it, baby. <laughs> and it's so actually really funny. good. It's, it's of the, like yeah. the, like Tolkien, like licensed games it's actually one that i i quite enjoy except you take so. the you take the party and you replace them with like b versions of all of them this is eradarin <laughs> and this is uh Koromir and <laughs> this is mandolf and and also they intersect I, I love that like oh and we were also there with the balrog and we fought with gandalf <laughs> on the bridge i'm like i didn't see that in the movies but that's they, it's all movie licensed too which is great yeah that's the thing like they they could only use 
things that were from the movie. Like they, it was kind of weird. They, they they got the license to make a game based on the movie content, but not the book content. So if it wasn't specifically uh, in one of the movies, it couldn't be in the game. And like, yeah, like you said, so they basically cool. just take the like trio of Lord of the Rings and they're like, let's just make Walmart versions of all of them. And like, that's who you guys <laughs> are. Yeah. <laughs> Great value. I've never heard anyone else bring up the Third Age. A pretty great game. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty good. Such an oddity. Lord of the Rings games in the PS2 era slap pretty hard. Yeah, yeah that's, games that's like true. Two Towers. Yeah, and yeah. Stuff. Like yeah. the movie games are. I, I quite enjoy them. They're like a good little hack and slash fun. If it's a book yep. license game, stay away. And if it's Gollum, <laughs> buy two copies. Buy, <laughs> buy them for your loved ones and your hated ones. <laughs> buy them for everyone's stocking stuffers this holiday season. I'm going to buy them, just use them as coasters. <laughs> 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 Every guest, you never explain it. <laughs> you left your game out. I know. Whoa, 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 don't put your drink on my table. Oh. Take one of these. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> I love that. Throw the disc. We went to a, uh, a fundraising event for a buddy uh, from EXP cast, uh, old podcast named Stoy at his house. And he bought like 50 copies of Anthem for like three bucks. And they were hidden all around his house, and you had to try and find a copy of Anthem for yourself before you left the party. So I have two copies of Anthem that are unopened, but... I have two. That's sick. <laughs> it felt so good when I finally found my copy. But yeah, like, every couch cushion on top of the shelves. And then somebody lost their keys, and I thought it was just an elaborate ruse to get everybody to start looking so that way they would find Anthems. But no, a guy actually lost his keys. I think he found them, though. That's it was very sad. They were he inside a copy of Anthem. <laughs> <laughs> the, one other aspect of the gameplay system before we jump into the story, I want to talk about armor customization, which is super powerful, potentially game-breaking, and I think a little half-baked. I, I originally didn't do much with it, but I feel like it's so close to being a very well-defined, fun aspect what are your guys' thoughts on armor customization? I, I basically, in my most recent playthrough, I don't think I customized a single piece of armor. I, like, looked at it a few times, and then I was just like, nah. I, I went to the one, like, cave where you can go get Yojimbo at, and I just grinded wow. until I got a, a, an armor that had no encounter ability on it. Yeah. And then yeah. I just had that for whenever I wanted to, like revisit places but not have to be peppered with fights later on and like other than that though i i pretty much just took everything as it was through the playthrough and like if it had a good ability i used it and if it didn't then it just sat there i sold it yeah yeah it's probably another byproduct of like being a speedrunner where like we don't really look at like the stats of like armor and gear you put on we're just like yeah 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 what else to oh no encounter oh baby sign me up or like you know buff my attack or something whatever it might be um yeah i i'm trying to remember if i did much with the armor either it's funny because i'm such a gear head when it comes to final fantasies you come from ff9 where gear is everything you got five slots putting all this shit on i think ff10 i was so probably like a lot of the people like you're alluding to it's game breaking we were so engulfed in just what the sphere grid was it was hard to think about min-maxing anything else going on in that game, at least for me. I, 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 I'm kind of like Mudska. I feel like I barely touched the armor, but I agree with you that I think you could destroy the balance of the game if you understood the upgrade system to its fullest. I did a lot. You did a lot. Okay. I did a lot. Anytime there was an, okay. anytime there was an open slot on a piece of armor... I uh -huh. I threw something in there. Yeah, I was like, I'm not gonna yeah. just waste these slots. Like, especially you get like the yeah. three and the four, and then like the uh, switch yeah. hitter with like four open slots, and I was just like HP 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 for Waka. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's yeah. like he's invincible now. <laughs> yeah, dude, I'd I'd be rolling into battles. I'd have something on or, and it would be like piercing, and then three <laughs> blank slots, and I'd just be like, oh fuck it, I guess it's piercing. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I, I was I wanted to ask you, what is? Did you find like? if you were doing it like frequently, did you find that there was like an easier to afford ability that you used frequently? It's a great question. And that you would plug in. Like, is there like one that you found that you used a lot on like 
most of your armors that you're doing? I think the problem is, uh, so this recent playthrough, I wound up doing a lot of stealing because I would just, you know, I'm trying to get everyone to use abilities. Yeah. And I had three characters with steel from my fucking around on this expert grid. <laughs> So I wound up getting, you know, I'd go through an area and I'd steal from a bomb, you know, a hundred times. And the problem is there's so many abilities like, oh, I'm going up against a boss that uses a lot of lightning spells. It's just expensive. Those abilities are all like rather expensive to get anything worth using. And I feel like if you could like move the abilities around after you purchase them or like it's so close to being like this great system where if you want to go into the strategy and invest into, I know what's coming up or I want to add HP plus 5% plus 10%. The, the problem is it's just not super viable because you don't have enough items to ki kind of afford uh, the customization. Mm -hmm. But I, I would go in if I knew that I was going to fight, you know, water enemies. Uh, that's why I would save all of my, my weapons that I ran into. So, you know, usually... You're going to have 10 different weapons, 20 weapons for every character just from fighting enemies. And I'm like, ooh, I got a water strike for Kamari. Going to hold on to that one. Then I'll switch that ability in. But I wanted there to be easier to be uh, customized in the armor. And I feel like it, if it was a little bit like a materia system, it might have been better. But I feel like it was close. But when you get to the end of the game, you can make weapons and armor that are better than the best things you can find naturally. Uh, better than the legendary uh, weapons, you can like create just some monstrous uh, custom pieces, which is well being great. able to put like uh, null anything on like Lulu yeah. or Yuna was just that was almost game breaking because then it was like like for the fights with Seymour where he would hit you with like Blizzara and he'd hit all three <laughs> characters. Like I would use Yuna to like protect everybody and just run through the list of null till I so all the elements are covered, but. Two of my people on the on the board would just naturally have resistance towards, you know, one or two different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, essentially, though, uh, confuse, poison, any status effect, uh, either proof yeah. or ward, I would do a lot of that. And if I ran into an enemy that I knew dropped the items I needed to create, like confuse ward, stone ward, which are the ones you can afford yeah. without doing a lot of investment, those are the abilities that I craved. Listen, man, you got to play one Final Fantasy and run into a Marlboro man before you're like, dog, if you can protect me from a status, because at some point in the late game, you're going to run into this thing. I ran into that in Final Fantasy VIII, my most recent playthrough, like two months ago. I ran to, I was like, kill it with fire, dude. Anything. All hands on deck. You, you better all, have first strike. Yes. All status effects. Because as a kid, you never... I just want to make my, my numbers go up, right? Now, nah, dude, you got to protect against all that dumb shit. Let's talk a little bit about the cosmology quick before we jump into the story. Understand <laughs> what this fucking world is. Set in the fantasy world of Spira, we talked about its influences. The far plane, um, heaven is a place on earth. You can go visit it. <laughs> 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 but uh, it's actually not your deceased loved ones. Um, pyre flies are like the force. They are mid chlorians life energy present in all living things, a physical expression of the spiritual forces of nature. When you go to the far plane, those are not your loved ones. It's the pyreflies feeling your memories and just recreating an image. <laughs> they're 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 like they're like the answer for everything. By the way, if you're if ever uh, you're ever like, if your question about Final Fantasy X begins with why and ends with any words, the answer yeah. is probably <laughs> pyreflies. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Great point, because this was fascinating when I read it. They can crystallize in the form of spheres, which can be used to record videos. That's ah. taller. Oh, guys, uh, out of fire fireflies, I need to go get change the stock on my camera. <laughs> like, how does that yeah. fucking work? <laughs> it, it, more it's, film? It, it's so prevalent in, like, the like lore of the game to the point where, like, among, like, when we did at Final Fantasy X, it, uh, we did a 
eight eight people we kind of handed off and did a relay at, at an rpg limit break event and like it got so to cool. the point we would just say we would just talk about pyreflies even when it wasn't actually pyreflies just because <laughs> everything normally is pyreflies there's like an 80 percent chance you're right though right just yeah uh, walk his hair gel made with pyreflies uh, all of it all of it is pyreflies all the way down that's how they breathe underwater pyreflies okay <laughs> now it makes sense pyreflies. that was my biggest question <laughs> Uh, apparently, though, you just practice enough and you can breathe underwater indefinitely. Uh, or <laughs> yep. <laughs> we never, weird. Even if people are punching you in the gut full force with, n- with right. no resistance <laughs> because of the water that they're submerged in. <laughs> I mean, that might be why Titus has the Ellen DeGeneres cut, because he could have like the Kevin Cosner gills from Waterworld under there. And we just never saw them. Ooh, he's, oh, he's hiding. Oh, there it is. Pyreflies. Pyreflies, though. Pyreflies. Pyreflies. Uh, humans since the creation of Spira developed special abil- abilities to harness the pyreflies known as magic. Magic is made through pyreflies. Uh, summoners can influence the pyreflies to summon creatures. Uh, these creatures come from the faith with a Y. Uh, they're humans who had their souls sealed in statues. Their powers can then be deployed by summoners. I'm following. Pyreflies. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. They create aeons, ultra powerful magical creatures uh, that are badass. Uh, uh, sometimes when you die, a summoner needs to do a special dance, and then your pyreflies go to the far plane. That's that's <laughs> how it works. <laughs> <laughs> they gotta be told to get the fuck out. Pretty much nailed it. <laughs> what happened to Grandpa, Mom? Oh, he died. Uh, we gotta get a dancer here quick. <laughs> He's gonna turn into a Marlboro. <laughs> dude titus is gonna get a chest tattoo too that says, just says people die yuna dances like that's <laughs> people can hate on his dialogue so listen he explains shit really directly and i appreciate it <laughs> if you die naturally and accept your death you naturally go to the far plane if you suffer or die before you're ready uh your life force will be left wandering the world uh Filled with hatred and jealousy, these lingering spirits can become monsters. Uh, most of, I think, all of the fiends are just upset people who died in a <laughs> weird way. Uh huh. They're just pissed. If a person is strongly attached to the world because of an intense emotion or an unkept promise, specifically, uh, they can refuse death. In which case, the pyreflies recreate their body. Uh, th- I feel like this this game uh, has just. A million. They do one like, oh, and they're not actually dead, and then they just like, all right, everyone's not dead. Well, because they have to like. <laughs> I think once they made the decision that there's going to be critical characters who are alive but totally not alive, they like had to have something to rationalize it, right? Like they can't just be uh, like, oh yeah, Seymour's actually dead, but we're just not going to fucking give you anything, right? Oren's not supposed to be here. We're just going to fucking lay. like. I feel like they made the choice to do that. Yeah. And then had to decide uh, this element of the Pyreflies deal, like, yeah. after the fact, to make it make sense. Because, like, I, I'm, I think people are more than willing with Final Fantasy to, like, go down the road with suspension of disbelief pretty heavily. Yeah, you got but, to. But I feel like the life and death thing, like, you got to give me something, I guess. So, uh-huh. at least even if it's not, like, the strongest explanation of how that's a deal, like, <laughs> at least they tried. So, yeah, it's okay. Uh, if you look, the Wikipedias will explain uh, all of this shit. And <laughs> I, I, remember, I remember the first time learning that Seymour died the first, one of the first times we fought him. And I was like, oh. And then the Pyreflies just 3D print him a new body. <laughs> and he's back in the fight. <laughs> no one danced. I'm hanging around. <laughs> Can't dance fast enough. I'm out. John DiMaggio is coming off of Futurama. And he's like, listen, guys, I... We can make pe- dead people alive for a very long time. <laughs> Just put Seymour's head in a jar. Got it. Also, I want to be the cat. Can I be the cat as well? <laughs> Is he the cat? He's Kamari as well. No yeah. way. Yep. Is he just everybody? Is this what, like a nutty professor thing? What a thing? nutty race. It's nutty John professor. Has, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yo, I'm Yuna, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> My daddy was a summoner, yeah? <laughs> Fucking wild. Before the game, I wrote a lot of outline. We're not going to do all of it. <laughs> it's not a lot of it, dude, because I wanted to know. I wanted to know who Lenny, Lenny was, and I wanted to know who these people were. But Spira exists for three millennia, 
made up of two continents. Humans learn magic. Humans learn technology. Magic and technology coexist, but they they start hating each other. Uh, the Bedols are the outbed, and they're a lower caste of society. They are forced to speak a different language and not intermingle with others, and even uh, inflicted magic to make their eyes have spirals so they could be identified as Albed. Uh, yeah, that's like some sketchy shit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think that's pretty fucking heavy metal. They're like, we want to be racist and we want to make it easy to do it too. <laughs> right. <laughs> I want people to cross the street when they see me. Very quick. No, the Alpha didn't do it to themselves. They had it done to them. Oh, I thought you. they were like, yeah, that's me. No, it's not like them representing. It's them being forced to represent. <laughs> okay. I just had that. I, that was a roller coaster represent. of emotions. Yeah, you're on the other side of that now. Yeah. Um, over the centuries, a division developed between the two largest cities, Xanarkand, who believed in magic and spirituality, and Bavel, dedicated itself to technology and machina, uh, they create a very dangerous weapon, which becomes relevant in a sequel. They go to a war, <laughs> summoners, things happen. Yu Yevin was, fuck, I could go into it. I don't know if it really matters much. Uh, he was a summoner. Uh, Xanarkand all sacrificed themselves to become a dream, uh, make a dream Xanarkand out on the water. Uh <laughs> Yu Yevin became a bug. His daughter Unaleska knows how to use the bug. It's like a lot. Hell you're, yeah. you're doing a great job, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you're nailing it. <laughs> all square games like reach that point where like, all right, I'm following, I'm following, I'm following. What the fuck is going on? Okay, yeah. And it's usually whatever is centered around the final boss. Cause yeah, he a bug. He's just a bug. Yeah, the faith created a massive, indestructible creature that would serve as armor for the bug. And Charged with protecting the city and keeping it alive, this was Sin. You haven't got absorbed into Sin. His consciousness was altered, so essentially he just becomes like his final will of destroy technology and civilizations to keep things, kind of bring it all down to an even even level. Unaleska and her husband, Zayon. Man, sometimes I say these things and my eyes start rolling in the back of my head. You need charts up. Yeah, she ordered Bavel to honor Sin and abandon Machina. This all is like kind of what sets up the world we're in now. Uh, Machina bad because Sin is there because Unaleska says so. And you can kill Sin, but it comes back very quickly. Mm -hmm. Like 10 years, which I totally misunderstood that my first few playthroughs. I thought that the, the calm lasted longer. But the fact that you are dying for a 10 year piece is not great. Yeah. So like whenever you are, you first meet Yuna and you get on the ship leaving Besaid, uh, and she like mentions that she knew Jekt and then she's like, yeah, he came here 10 years and three months ago and kind of indicating that uh, it has only been about 10 years between when uh, Oren and Jekt went with Braska to defeat Sin to the present. Uh -huh. So like, that's kind of like your indicator that the calm is probably not a particularly long time, I guess. <laughs> no, every generation's going to get it. If the summoners have to die to create a calm for a decent period of time, I get it. I can understand more of the rationalization, like 10 years isn't long enough, but 10 years is a lot. Uh, but mm -hmm. if you defeat Sin with the final Aeon, uh, the little bug just grabs a new Aeon and makes new armor and grows into a new Sin. And I don't know if Sin looks the same every time. If he was to merge into Jex Sin, would it be this giant blitzball weirdo with a mullet? Like <laughs> I hope he looks the same because I, I, I have said this on stream a multitude of times. You ever like see any of the FMVs where like after Sin has finally like been exposed and you've seen his face and like the camera will, like hard zoom in on his face? I think he's really kind of cute. Like, I wish there was he's like, I, I, wish the, I wish the Square Enix store had Sin plushies. Like, I would get one. Like, I think yeah. he's like kind of a cute little, I don't know, little little whale. Yeah, thing. Squishmallow. Yeah, the only thing that makes him imposing is that obviously he's, you know, apocalyptic Labo style creature, but like, he's massive. He's gigantic, But you actually see him, you're like, ah, he's. Yeah. He's a cute little that, whale. That's a plushie right there. I, I do yeah. like, the, like, the whenever they, uh, 
they see him and they're like confronting him and you're on the airship and like you see like the the technology and there's like a little cursor that's like zooming in on all different parts of them and it's just like oh yeah this is all pretty much fucking bad like <laughs> yeah <laughs> This fin's bad. That fin's bad. Yeah, yeah kind of. Like, yeah. We kinda... didn't go fight the undercarriage, but it's bad. <laughs> like, he's so big. It's like, why are we analyzing him? Like, yeah, he looks fucking bad. Like, this is not, not a good look. But yeah, and no, I like hit Sin, that so. fin with a beach. You hit that fin with a beach ball, and it does 99-99 <laughs> damage. I'm it's sorry, good. God, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to feel weird about this the rest of my life. I'm killing my religion. <laughs> Yes, the entire system of the Yevon religion is predicated on a lie designed to subjugate people. Square Enix going hard on organized no. religion. Theocratic fascism? Woo! Uh, big time. <laughs> uh, they changed it to F-A-Y-T-H, so it's not attacking modern faith at all. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Surely that, that's definitely not at all what they are getting at. <laughs> what are we to call the monster? Let's call it Sin. <laughs> That yeah, was a little on the nose, don't you think? <laughs> yeah, it'd be fine. They should have spelled so sin with a Y. Them. If they spelled sin with a Y, I think people would not have noticed. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. I wish they'd have the balls to go all the way. Like instead of summoning Shiva or Ifrit, you summon Jesus. <laughs> this is Jesus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He just breaks a loaf of bread and then like a storm happens or something. I don't know what we would do. Summon summons fish. <laughs> right. I'd be there for that. The sign of Yevin is actually an old Blitzball victory sign, their little thing that they do with their hands. That's that's for Blitzball. And the mm -hmm. Hymn of the Faith was a song sung by Xanarkind against Bavel. Which the Hymn of the Faith does have lyrics. They're just garbage. Like, pray for you, Yevon, dream of the faith. Nothing too exciting. But it sounds pretty. It sounds great. Yes. It's the kind of thing you want to sing in a bathroom somewhere with a lot of echo, very loud. Yeah. Good acoustics. <laughs> and then millennia pass. There's some calms. There's some sins. Uh, it, what is BG? Before game. Before That's game. That's what my okay. outline has. But we're going to... Have this be the end of the first episode, and then the next one, we will cover the story of the game. Now that we talked about the systems, now we can talk about mm. the hair for an hour. <laughs> so we're going to be done here, and then uh, where could our listeners um, find more content from you, Mutsky? Uh, so I stream on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Mutsky. Um, I've... I've Recently, not really been doing a whole lot of Final Fantasy stuff, although that's most of what I what I stream. But I've been I've been playing all the Resident Evil games. I've never played them before, so I've been playing Yo. through all those games. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which one? How are you, are you on? enjoying them? Um, um, yeah. they're, they're pretty fun. They're pretty fun. I've played some of the originals and some of the remakes, and I'm kind of in no particular order. <laughs> so <laughs> kind of been dipping my toes in. in You're not like things. starting at one. Yeah, and then going yeah, through. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I've been enjoying them and then, um, not like a big thing or anything, but one of my friends, um, from Twitch and I, we do a once a month podcast. It's called the video game draft where we bring people in and we pick a year and we do like a fantasy football style draft for video games That's so cool! in, in that year. Yeah. We have like, instead of like positions, we do like, you'll do like one action adventure, one RPG, one uh, one category is called Meta 75, which means it has to have scored a 75 or less on Metacritic. <laughs> um, no it's fixed objectives, value, which man. are like set your puzzle box games with no beginning end, beginning or middle or end or whatever, and like fighting style games. And it's just a lot of fun. So we do that like once a month. So I've been doing that um, and just playing some games. Yeah. So Twitch, Muskie, you can find me there. I'll be there. Fuck yeah. Spike. Yep. God, that's I'm sorry. I know I could talk about myself, but that's cool. Do you have those archived anywhere? Yeah, I'm they're, they're on Spotify. So I'll, I'll send them to you. I'll send them to you. They're they're really fun. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we'll put yeah. a link in the episode description as well because oh, everyone. Yeah, that out. actually. Is, I love analyzing like going back back. 1997. What? Oh, okay, that was the Golden Eye year. We um. We did. We do a couple of like other ones that aren't in the year specific. We did like a spooky draft for Halloween. We did. We did the Final Fantasy okay. soundtrack draft where you had, we had different types of songs Aww. that you did dress on. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you uh, Spike. I think you'll like you'll best enjoy. airship, best chocobo. Yeah, it was like kind of yeah, yeah, like yeah, that yeah. sort of deal. Yeah. Oh God, I love. That. I'm gonna absorb those. It's fun. It's a lot That's of fun. Well, because like like I said, like it's like I said, it's like a fantasy draft. So once someone picks something, like it's gone, right? So you kind of have yeah. to like figure out. There's like a game within the game, and it's pretty good. Yeah, you gotta yeah, have some backups yeah. ready. 
Yeah. yeah. As someone who loves fantasy drafts, like fantasy football and stuff, and loves video games and video game history and analyzing music and stuff, that is like, you made that for me. I don't know if you knew that or not, but <laughs> y'all made that content for me. Well, it's got uh, me yeah. to try like a bunch of things that I for sure never would have played in my entire life. Like, for, sure. like, so it's cool to just like expose yourself to things like there's a they, the Toyota released a game called Yaris when they were trying to sell the Toyota Yaris. And it's this really shitty like driving sim. <laughs> and I, awesome. heard, I never would have heard of it if it wasn't for this. So. <laughs> Phenomenal. But yeah, and then I'm Spike Vegeta. Uh, you can follow me on twitch.tv slash Spike Vegeta. I'm also on stuff like Twitter or Zitter or whatever the fuck it's called now. Um, <laughs> we'll go with Zitter. <laughs> I, like, I like Zitter, dude. Um, I am actually, I started uh, just last month a, uh, a thing I've always wanted to do, uh, SNES Mania. Uh, yeah. Uh, amazing speedrunner, uh, the Mexican runner, uh, many years ago did a NES mania where he played through every NES game that was released in the US. It was over 700 games. And now I have decided I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to finish all 718 US released Super Nintendo games. Uh, That's amazing. I, this will take many. Yeah, this will take many years. <laughs> I just finished games 19 and 20 today. As of this recording, I beat my second. Go- There's a lot of golf games, actually, uh, <laughs> and super tennis. Over 20 percent of the library. Fun fact are sports games or not fun. The fact. So, <laughs> yeah, as someone who didn't play sports games at all growing up, this is like, all right, a motherfucker. The golf games are so hard. I can't tell you how hard the golf games are. Jesus Christ. But uh, yeah, it's a good time. So if you want to watch. Any and all Super Nintendo games, I'm going to be playing that for the next five years on stream. In addition to speedruns and stuff, I got into Super Mario RPG remake, speedrunning and stuff. Yeah, it's, I like to speedrun a bunch of different games. But yeah, follow me there. It's cool. And thank you both so much for joining us for this episode. Uh, big delight. And fuck yeah, it's fun talking about Final Fantasy X. I'm having a great time. And yeah. that's why we are going to come back for part two, where we talk about what the fuck happens in the game. And we're going to talk about the cloisters of trials and we're going to need more beer, but we're going to make, <laughs> we're going to make it. And we are here at the dog cast. Make sure to follow us on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on blue sky, on threads. We're on all the things. Just look up here at the dog cast or on Instagram. It's at hot dog cast. If you want to send us your favorite blitzball players, you can send us an email at hair, the dog at gmail.com. Uh, big thanks to our executive producers on Patreon, Ryan Christina, Kip Kip Kipper, Brian Ward, Jordan Hoff, Phil Wright, Philliam Birkin, Cole Del Gardno, and Bryant Ross. We appreciate your support. Now, part two of this episode is going to be available to Patreon members almost immediately. Uh, otherwise, you'll be having to wait for a look, uh, quite a while. Uh, so if you want access to part two right away, check out patreon.com slash hair of the dog cast. And there's a bunch of bonus episodes uh and we have a great community on our discord and uh, that's how you can join us there there's free trials on patreon as well so make sure to check that out patreon.com slash hair the dogcast and we are part of the tokyo beat podcast network check out all of the other amazing shows so we'll be right back for part two otherwise thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time <laughs>